Perhaps it's very appropriate to have, as a guest speaker, another fellow researcher, a person who did not fly a, or I should say, did not board a flying saucer for a ride, not saying that that isn't possible. He didn't meet a long-haired Venusian. That may also be possible. But however, the man did serious investigations on the flying saucer subject. He did it for three years. He was affiliated with the International Flying Saucer Bureau, of Bridgeport, Connecticut. His communication with a number of groups and individuals all over the world. He publishes the Saucer, the Saucerian Review, which comes out in an annual, I believe now. These are also available in our, in our lobby. He's a businessman, well-respected in his community. He's a school teacher. He's a motion picture booking agent, the only one in West Virginia, I understand. Mr. Barker came into flying saucer research more or less as a skeptic. He wanted to be convinced. That's why he did research on it. He wanted to be convinced either one way or another that either they're real or they're not. I think he had a notion that perhaps they were Russian or perhaps uh, owing some origin to some part of this world, that they were not extraterrestrial. I'm not going to take a stand here to say what his views are on it now. He'll tell you himself. But I think that's enough. I'd like to introduce to you Mr. Gray Barker of Clarksburg, West Virginia, author of The New Too Much About Flying Saucers. Thank you, Don. Uh, delegates and uh, members of the Federation, I hope you can hear me all right because I'm a little taller than the rest of you and the mic is down there. If you can't, someone yell and uh, we'll try to turn up the volume. I think one thing is very evident in the beginning that I am not one of the little men which you may have heard about. <laughs> not that they don't exist, I think that's possible. In fact, uh, Don tells me that if any of you are really interested, he has some in the uh, back room, which you may see for 50 cents additional, uh, a slight additional charge. But, uh, oh, oh yes, neither am I uh, one of the men in the black suits. I intended to bring along uh, my light one, which was, I was going to wear, but in leaving West Virginia in such a hurry to get up here, I just plain forgot it. But being about six feet four puts me into an advantage that some of you may not have because I'm up here a little closer uh, where all of those uh, things are flying about. Yet it's rather strange that I have never personally seen one. A fellow called me up oh, two months ago. I was doing some, uh, some television interviews at the time. And uh, one of the first things he asked me, I suppose uh, he was trying to line up uh, some sort of interview, was, uh, Mr. Barker, have you ever seen a flying saucer? And uh, wanting to be completely honest about it, I said, no, I have not. And uh, I uh, heard a little gasp at the other end. Uh, here was a man who uh, thought perhaps that uh, I, having uh, been uh, so greatly interested in the subject of flying saucers, of why I hadn't seen one. But uh, I had to explain to him that even though that I haven't seen one, as uh, many of you have done, there is no reason why I should discount the stories of others, especially the many uh, scientific reports or the what we would consider the most reliable, those by reliable observers such as uh, airline pilots who are trained to uh, know what they're seeing in the sky. I think that uh, maybe I haven't seen any, but certainly I should listen to other people. And no matter how fantastic the story uh, might sound to me at the beginning, there is no reason uh, for me to uh, discount it. Uh, yet, um, I uh, would have to say that uh, I think that some of the flying saucer stories are the bunk. Now, before you start uh, throwing Martian brickbats or Venusian uh, vegetables or whatever they have up there at me, let me explain myself. I said I think most saucers are the bunk. 
and that certainly leaves me a lot of leeway. I think that uh, we saucer fans, as some of us call ourselves, are as greatly as fault as those who won't even admit to the possibility of saucers. A lot of us uh, interpret a lot of things that we see as flying saucers that perhaps may not be. So I think that perhaps half of the saucers uh, now reported are, and uh, I'll throw the Air Force quite a large bone, uh, misinterpretations of natural objects such as balloons, aircraft, celestial bodies, and all the other explanations. I think uh, that some of them could be explained as temperature inversions, uh, Dr. Menzel's sun dogs, and uh, all those other natural phenomena that we know little about and subsequently may misinterpret. But I certainly do not discount all of the sightings. And I think that out of those remaining reports, we have something very real to go on, and that's uh, on what I have tried to uh, base what I have done. Now, let me reiterate that I am not here trying to attempt to minimize the case for flying saucers or to attempt to explain them away. If I were, I certainly wouldn't have taken the trouble to uh, uh, write a book about the subject nor taken time off to come up here from Clarksburg, West Virginia, where I live. It's quite a drive. And uh, I'm sure that if you people did not believe that there are such things as flying saucers, you wouldn't have taken the trouble and uh, your good time to come out here and uh, listen to me tonight. I think that at one time, perhaps in 1952, I was a great deal more skeptical, as uh, Don, I believe, pointed out, than I am today. I uh, find it rather hard remembering just what my attitude is because uh, uh, things change. I think I was like the average person on the street who uh, maybe just doesn't want to think about flying saucers or something uh, so strange, so unreal, it upsets his everyday scheme of thing that he doesn't want to think about it. After all, it is a pretty hard job to think for some people. Well, in 1952, I suppose uh, I was like that. Uh, I wasn't uh, at least uh, actively interested in flying saucers, or I saw the reports. Uh, I saw where uh, uh, this uh, Captain Mantle was shot down by temperature inversion. Uh, I read about that, but uh, I don't suppose I thought too much about it. And uh, I read where the uh, temperature inversions uh, took off from the ground, leaving large burn places on the ground. But anyway, my skepticism was uh, somewhat changed in September of 1952. And uh, I want to go into that a little before I get into uh, uh, the main part of the book. They knew too much about flying saucers. Uh, now, this was a very uh, usual day when a very unusual thing happened. That was in early September 1952, in a very unusual year, 1952. As you remember, a lot of strange things were happening. Uh, that's when uh, uh, we had so many reports from all over the country, and there were a number of uh, very strange sightings reported involving uh, 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 things which were seen inside uh, what people termed spaceships. But anyway, let's picture yourself uh, living at that time, maybe as a housewife, uh, if possible as a, uh, a young boy or a girl, anywhere from nine years old to 17, because this is, in the pe is the people which this involves. And let's imagine that you're, uh, you're kids and you're playing baseball at a playground about dusk. I guess the shadows are beginning to creep over everything, and it gets at that spooky time of evening when uh, you're about ready to quit playing, but you would like to play a while longer. But suddenly you see something shoot over across the sky. <clears throat> it uh, probably is a shooting star because that's what it looked like to you. But the peculiar thing about this, and of course this actually happened, was that it seems to land on a nearby hilltop. Well, a lot of uh, shooting stars seem to come down, uh, really 
uh, meteorites go on over, but uh, sometimes they seem to come down on the hill, but really they're going over, and you think perhaps this is what has happened. However, you look up on the hill and you see a kind of light there. Whatever it ha has been is there. It did land or come to the earth. And the strange thing about this light is that it's strangely pulsing, uh, getting dim to bright, dim to bright. I don't know if the, these people were greatly frightened or not. I think that it was just a normal uh, curiosity. Now, these people in Flatwoods, West Virginia, 1952, that's what I'm talking about, uh, were people who hadn't heard about flying saucers. They were country people uh, with uh, fewer advantages than, uh, than most of us have who live in the city. Their outlooks are, are not as broad. They haven't heard and seen as many things. Uh, they hadn't had television yet to educate them on a lot of things. Uh, they certainly hadn't read science fiction. So maybe that is why uh, they weren't greatly frightened. So uh, they went up on top of the hill to look at this thing. And uh, as soon as they got there, uh, they were so frightened, almost out of their wits, that they immediately got out of there as fast as they could. And I think the best way to report something about this is to read you the uh, United Press story on the uh, thing, which I have here quoted in my book. I remember reading this at breakfast one morning. Uh, I live in Clarksburg, which is about 75 miles from this town of Flatwoods, uh, where the famous Flatwoods monster landed. And I was reading this story. Police say Braxton monster product of mass hysteria. Sutton, September 14. Seven Braxton County residents vowed today that a Frankenstein monster with B.O., uh, drove them from a hilltop near here. But police figured the smelly boogeyman was a product of mass hysteria. That sounds like a typical newspaper story, doesn't it? The thing described as witnesses as half man, half dragon, had not been reported seen since Friday night. But residents of the area said a foul odor still clung to the hilltop yesterday. All of this started when Mrs. Kathleen May of Flatwood said she and six boys, one a 17-year-old National Guardsman, climbed the hill to investigate her two small sons' report that a flying saucer landed there. Now, that's incorrect, as a lot of newspaper stories is, because they hadn't heard of flying saucers before then. But she said that they found a fire-breathing monster 10 feet tall with a bright green body and a blood-red face that waddled toward them, quote, with a bouncing, floating motion and sent them scurrying down the hillside. She said the monster exuded an overpowering odor, like metal, she called it, that so sickened them they vomited for hours afterward. It looked worse than Frankenstein, said Mrs. Mack. It couldn't have been human. Well, naturally, I was pretty skeptical after I read this story, but here was something that happened uh, near where I had grown up in the country on a farm, and it was quite convenient to go and see about, so I decided to go there and find out just what gave with this. Uh, here was a story that uh, was obviously made up. It couldn't have happened, I thought, and uh, perhaps such a thing uh, should be exposed and, uh, and made known for what it was. So I departed for Flatwoods as soon as I could get away from the office, which was a couple of days, and uh, arrived in Flatwoods uh, rather late at night, uh, where I stopped at a friend's house who uh, knew the people. And uh, this friend of mine was very skeptical. He said that he didn't believe a word of it. But the next morning, I went to the local, uh, one of the local newspapers, the Braxton Central and talked to uh, Mr. Holt Byrne, who was also the mayor of the town. Earlier, he had released a news story that this thing had been a meteor which had crashed and the gases from it was uh, what the people had seen and thought was a monster. But when I arrived, he uh, wasn't so sure about it. He had been talking to Ivan Sanderson, whom some of you may know, who had come there also to investigate the story. 
And the mayor suggested, seriously, that I drive out to Flatwoods and uh, talk to a nunley boy, the four one of the boys who was 14 years old, who had gone to the hilltop to see the thing. He said that Mrs. May, the only adult who was along, had uh, gone to New York. As soon as this had happened, they had got her and some of the other witnesses on the We the People television broadcast, so I couldn't see them that day. So I went out to Flatwoods, which is a very short drive, and located the nunley boy whose father incidentally had seen the uh, thing go over. And uh, I was very much surprised when this uh, kid sat down and started telling me the story because uh, he sounded as if he were telling the truth. Uh, he said that um, as soon as they saw the object go overhead, uh, he and the other children in the playground decided to go up and see what it was, and they ran up to a railroad, which would take them to the location, and stopped at Mrs. May's house. She was the housewife who was along. At first, uh, she didn't want to go with them. Uh, she said, that's just a story you're telling me that couldn't be. But she looked out the door, and, and there uh, she could see on top of the hill this strange light uh, pulsing, getting dim and bright, uh, as the others described it. So uh, she went along with them. Now, there were seven people in the party, and I'll read you the names. Uh, Mrs. May, the only uh, adult, Jean Lemon, 17, Neil Nunley, 14, Tommy Hire, 10, Ronnie Shaver, 10, and Mrs. May's two children, Eddie, 13 years old, and, and Fred, 12 years old. Well, they started up the hill. It's, uh, it's quite a walk up there, as uh, some of you who have been there uh, and investigated, I'm sure some of you have. I know my two friends here from Ohio have. Uh, when they arrived near the top of the hill, they said they could first smell a, a funny odor. However, that didn't uh, discourage them from going on. Personally, I think uh, I would have been uh, getting out of there because I would much rather be a live coward than a dead hero. But anyway, these people uh, just went on. And uh, at the very top of the hill, as they came over, they came upon everything at the same time. And uh, this is what I got out of them that they saw. I'm not reporting everything I heard. I'm reporting only uh, those things that uh, they all saw and were sure of. Down over the side of the hill, they said they saw a huge uh, glowing object, which was, uh, according to some of them, the size of a house. Others weren't able to estimate the size. Others hadn't got a very good look. But it was established that it was a glowing uh, globe-like thing. And evidently, they were looking at that. Now, all of this happened in a very few seconds. I don't know how many, but I'm sure very few. And while they were looking at the globe, uh, I understand uh, the lemon boy thought he saw some eyes in the tree. He thought it was a uh, animal's eyes of some kind, and he showed his uh, flight, a flashlight on it. And all of a sudden, it seemed to light up, and there was a huge uh, creature, they said, about 10 to, feet, to 15 uh, feet tall, and uh, a very uh, strange-looking uh, object indeed. Uh, as well as I could establish, they didn't get a good look at its, uh, at its feet, if it had feet, or the lower part of its body. Uh, they only uh, saw and were concentrating upon the head, of it. Perhaps that was what was illuminated. But they said that it had a round uh, face, which was blood red. And they said that out of its eyes were coming beams of light. Now, Mrs. May, who uh, perhaps was the most excitable of them, was sure that these beams of light was coming right at her. And uh, they were shining on her. But the, the children who were... Uh, uh, seemed to uh, be more objective about it, said that they were coming out over their heads, that they were parallel to the base of whatever this thing was. Uh, these were greenish-orange rays of light. At the uh, apex of its head was a kind of hood-like affair, which was black. Uh, one boy uh, told me that it looked like a dust cap, as we would imagine a child sitting in school in olden times with this uh, conical... Uh, a hat on his head. But anyway, they didn't stay around long enough to investigate, which I don't blame them for doing. And incidentally, all the time they were smelling this, this very peculiar odor, which uh, they couldn't describe. 
Uh, some said, well, it smelled like rotten eggs at first, then you would question them, they said it smelled like burning metal. But it ended up that uh, another, none of them knew exactly uh, what this odor was like. It was something that they hadn't encountered before. So uh, immediately they ran off the hill as fast as they could. and. Uh, uh, I understand that uh, several of them were ill, they were uh, vomiting. Uh, it so happened that a funeral director came by with his ambulance about that time and he gave some of them uh, first aid, whatever that would involve, maybe smelling salts or something. I don't know, he never would talk about it. But anyway, they were in uh, a bunch of pretty scared people after seeing all this. They called the sheriff of the county, uh, whom I've also interviewed about, but he at the time was in another part of the county investigating another similar report of a, an object crashing on a hillside. However, nothing was ever found out about that. Uh, it seemed as if on this particular evening, objects were seen going over in the skies over several states. Ivan Sanderson said he thought he could trace uh, one object over Huntington, Charleston, some of the other cities into Flatwoods. But at any rate, whatever this was, was connect, connected with the aerial phenomena, which was rather widespread at that time. The um, first witnesses on the scene, and this is where this story uh, does get stranger, were a couple of boys, about 18 or 20, who went up on the hill, I think about a half hour after that, and they found nothing at all there. Of course, it was dark, they couldn't see anything, but certainly there wasn't any monster. About a half hour or an hour later, the sheriff arrived after coming from Frametown investigating the other report. Uh, he didn't find anything either, uh, and no odor either, immediately after this occurrence. So whatever it was, if it were real and was there, it must have gone away very, very quickly. The next morning, uh, a newspaper editor who edited the Braxton Democrat, the other little weekly newspapers, these come out every week and not uh, dailies as we're accustomed to, uh, went up on the hill very early in the morning to investigate. Uh, he could see nothing either, but, uh, but something did strike him after looking around. In the grass uh, where the monster is reported to have been, he saw <clears throat> what he thought were skid marks in the grass as if uh, someone had been on skis and had uh, slid down the hill on them. Whatever it was, it had been light in weight because it hadn't, in, hadn't indented itself into the soil. But it seemed to be going down toward uh, the area where the globular shape was seen. And where it was seen, there was a large area of grass mashed down. So uh, it was established that whatever had been there had left some trace of itself. Uh, he couldn't smell anything and was puzzled over the account of the odor. He thought it still should be around. But he uh, bent to the ground and uh, snuffed there. He said that, um, that he knew that uh, gas, uh, uh, when it went away, it sort of settled to the ground and you could uh, detect it there long after it had gone. And he said that sure enough, he could detect this rather uh, nauseous and, uh, and almost suffocating odor near the ground. So that um, about uh, leaves the thing where it was, a uh, very uh, puzzling account, uh, but one which I came away from uh, very much convinced uh, had happened. I wasn't sure it had been exactly as uh, the kids had reported it. After all, uh, they probably were, and very surely were, uh, scared. But something had been there. I was convinced that these people were telling the truth. I think that uh, after you would talk to a number of people and, and try to catch them up, as, as I surely was doing, and uh, be unable to tear down their stories, that uh, you also uh, uh, would know if someone was uh, handing you a line or, or telling you some truth. Anyway, uh, that was the story of the Flatwoods Monster. So I drew, drove back to Clarksburg uh, pondering this. Well, I said if, if I can admit that that was real and that it did happen, some of these other stories uh, uh, may be true also and may bear looking into. I suppose I had caught the bug, as it's been called, and, and right there I became intensely interested in finding out what the saucers were. 
I thought that if I gave uh, four or five weeks to it, I could solve the complete mystery and, uh, and get rid of it, as some people do when they get into this thing. But, of course, I'm still at it and perhaps uh, maybe farther from the truth than I was when I started. But anyway, I was thinking at that time, having heard so many other reports, that if um, someone uh, could um, form a club or organization to uh, gather all of this information together and analyze it, that some definite conclusions might be reached. Well, just after that, I heard about just such a man who had done that. One of the very first who organized a flying saucer organization. Now, that man was Albert K. Bender, the, the fellow over whom there has been so much controversy of late. Uh, he had a club, which he called the International Flying Saucer Bureau. Well, I thought uh, that surely was just a high-sounding name, but uh, when I uh, found out about it, I found, surely enough, the fellow had a chapter in England and uh, members in Australia and even uh, South Africa, I believe. In fact, the fellow was all over the world. So uh, here was something I wanted to find out about. So I got in touch with Bender, and he was immediately enthusiastic about my joining the organization. I was appointed the state representative for West Virginia. My job was to uh, collect uh, money from memberships and send in all the accounts from my state, which I begun, uh, began by sending in the report on the Flatwoods Monster. Eventually, uh, we got into the thing a little further, and we decided that if we had a special a bureau w within the uh, larger one or a department which could very carefully investigate certain selected reports that we might uh, decide whether some of these better reports were the truth or whatever they might be. So a department of investigation was set up. I was given the rather high sounding uh, uh, title of chief investigator and, uh, of course, I was very proud of my membership cards, but really we were very serious about it. And uh, others appointed were Mr. August C. Roberts, who was a uh, person who was an expert in photography. A lot of flying saucer photos were cropping up. We wanted to find out if they were real or, or maybe tricked up. Uh, Mr. Dominic C. Lucchesi was... Uh, in the uh, thing in charge of the aeronautics. He uh, knew something about that. A uh, Reverend S.L. Daw of Washington, D.C., and a Mr. Lonzo Dove of uh, Broadway, Virginia, uh, an amateur astronomer. Here were people which uh, I had working with me which were pretty good in these certain fields that they knew something about. So we ran uh, several reports uh, through this special department. In fact, uh, a couple of photographs which uh, we decided uh, weren't flying saucers at all, but just reflections uh, off the sun at that time. But anyway, uh, we all became very close friends, all of us in this uh, little department within the Bureau, and especially uh, Bender and I became uh, very friendly. Uh, mainly through the mail, and I got to know a lot about these other people who were working with me. Now, that was why it was so surprising when I received a tape recording one day, which uh, rather set me back again. It was a quite mystifying thing. Uh, this was a tape recording from Dominic C. Lucchese, the aeronautical consultant for the Department of Investigation, and I would like to read out of the book here uh, just a few of the words that he had on the recording. The uh, more or less whole thing is in the book. He says, But actually, Gray, some very interesting things have happened, and the only way I can describe these to you is by using tape. Uh, he's talking about interesting things in the International Flying Saucer Bureau. So when I heard this, I rather sat up here with something a little different, I thought. Then Don continues, As far as my being investigated by someone is concerned, uh, no one that I know of has interrogated Augie Roberts or myself unless it might have been someone with whom we are well acquainted and uh, whom we might not have realized was an investigator of one type or another. 
Well, in the course of uh, their conversation, they were talking to him by telephone. They were planning to go to Bridgeport to see him, and the car developed trouble. So Augie Roberts uh, called Bender and asked him if there was anything new in the, in the flying saucers. And uh, I'll return to Dominic's tape again. This is all very hard to describe about Al, that is, for actually the telephone conversation was not between Al and myself, but between him and Augie. Actually, the phone call lasted for about 20 or 25 minutes. To make a long story short, Gray, I can't give it to you word for word, but what had happened was something like this. Al Bender told Augie that Space Review, that was a little publication which they got out, that Space Review would come out in October, but whether it would come out after that was something else. It seems something strange has occurred in IFSB. That was the initials of the International Flying Saucer Bureau. Well, Augie was quite persistent and kept pushing Al for more information. Finally, Al said bluntly, I know the secret of the disks. He added that three men had visited him and in effect shut him up completely as far as saucer investigation is concerned. Uh, the way uh, uh, Dominic gathered it, Al had run across something in the uh, course of his investigations and uh, uh, this sort of rang a bell in his mind. He thought he had it. He thought he had the answer to the uh, flying saucer riddle. Uh, he told us later that he had uh, names and places, whatever that could mean, to back it up. But he made one mistake. He uh, took this theory, or whatever it was, and submitted it to someone, he said. He wouldn't tell us whom. Uh, perhaps a magazine, I thought, uh, maybe the government, uh, maybe to a friend. But anyway, when the three men uh, came to see him, he said that they had that very same piece of paper in their hands. Well, as, uh, as uh, we could figure it out from what we could get out of Bender, who uh, seemed to be terrified by this thing, he said that, that after the three men were there, he was ill and he couldn't eat for three days, and he was sure he had turned white uh, when he talked to them. And I, I began to think... Uh, well, what uh, could scare a fellow like that? Here was a grown man. If, uh, if three uh, men would walk in to see me, certainly I would be nervous, but I don't see what they could tell me which would make me so frightened. So we uh, were determined to, uh, to find out more about this. After all, Bender hadn't said who the three men in black really were. Uh, at that time... Uh, it sounded like the government to us because uh, we imagined that perhaps uh, the government was interested in keeping all of this a secret from the people. Perhaps they were afraid that if the people uh, got to know too much about the flying saucers, they would be frightened. Uh, it would be something uh, uh, that happened uh, similar to the Orson Welles broadcast, which you've heard about. But anyway, we were... Uh, more confused as ever. And I had a very uh, strange uh, reaction after hearing this. Uh, here was an investigator, uh, something like myself, uh, who had his home entered, uh, who was visited by three people who, uh, who didn't treat him very kindly, evidently, and uh, who was just badly shaken. And uh, it didn't seem uh, he was permitted to go ahead and talk further about flying saucers. In fact, I was a little scared myself. If someone could shut up uh, Mr. Bender, here I was. I was putting out a publication called The Saucerian. It was going all over the world. Uh, maybe someone would uh, interfere with me. Was it the government? I wondered if it was. Surely something very serious must be happening for the government to be uh, interested to such a point that they would uh, obviously abridge uh, freedoms in coming and telling someone not to uh, talk about a certain subject. Uh, anyway, we decided uh, to try to get to the bottom of the thing, so we decided to go to Bridgeport, Connecticut, and uh, try to uh, see Bender personally and uh, 
question him at great length and see if we could get anything out of him. Well, as the little interview I'm going to read here in a moment discloses, we didn't learn a whole lot, although we did get some interesting responses. But immediately after I had received the tape, I called up Bender. He answered the phone, but he sounded uh, very strange, uh, much unlike his usual self. And, uh, of course, I got around to the subject of flying saucers immediately. And he said, uh, the saucers uh, do not interest me anymore. I believe uh, that was his exact words. Maybe he said, don't. He, and then he repeated, I've lost all interest in them. I wondered why a man would lose interest so quickly when he had once been so interested. Uh, I asked him, I said, um, Al, is this because it... Uh, uh, the reason you aren't interested, is that because you found out that they're a government invention, maybe? Or, uh, or is the information you have so uh, terrifying that uh, it's uh, rather frightening and, uh, and bad for you to think about? And he said, well, it was the latter. That's all he would say. We went to Bridgeport and uh, I walked in on our good friend who treated us very nicely but would keep uh, telling us that uh, he wasn't permitted to uh, tell us much about what had happened. But anyway, we got in a lot of questions, and I'm going to read a lot of these, not a lot of them, but just a few of these questions and answers which took place there. Now, the first few that I read, he'll say I can't answer that to all of them. So uh, we'll get over that quickly. Question, when did the three men visit you? Answer. I can't answer that. Question, who were the men? I can't answer that. Were they from the government? I can't answer that. Do saucer come from space? I can't answer that. And uh, a lot more responses similar. Uh, can you tell me where you found your source of information? Answer, I was turning a theory over and over in my mind. When I got some actual names and places to back it up, I submitted it to someone. Then the men came. Who was that someone you mentioned? I can't answer that. Is the flying saucers going to be a help to the world? It's going to be both good and bad. And so on answers like that that uh, you can't exactly put together into any meaning. Uh, all they serve to do is to intrigue you further and increase in your own mind the mystery of what he knew. Uh, we were desperately trying to find out what it was that Bender had run across, perhaps through accident, which had brought this trouble down upon him, whatever kind of trouble it was. We tried to figure who the three men were. Well, the first thought was the government. But first of all, we thought uh, government men uh, don't go around dressed conspicuously or trying to look like cloak and dagger operators, uh, which these three men uh, looked like. They had on uh, all dark uh, clothing. And uh, neither do uh, uh, people, at least from the FBI and some of the other investigative organizations, neither do they go around threatening people. In fact, uh, you do the talking, they just ask questions, they don't tell you anything. And uh, it, it was a great doubt in our mind that uh, government man had visited Albert Bender. Well, if not government man, who could it possibly be? Well, we thought of everything, maybe it could be space man. A lot of people thought that there were such things and it certainly hadn't been proven that there couldn't be. Uh, it certainly uh, would frighten me if uh, someone would walk into my room and uh, I would say to them, uh, let me see your credentials. And uh, this person say, would say, uh, here are my credentials. And instead of showing me a card, you would just simply disappear, or walk through a wall or something, dematerialize. Uh, that would certainly shake me, and if such a person would tell me to do something, I would think a long time before I didn't do it. But I'm not suggesting that it was a spaceman who visited Al Bender, or anyone in particular. It is a great mystery to me, and that is one reason why I wrote a book about the matter. I thought that if uh, I should get all of the story, 
and some other very interesting ones together, which were cropping up and uh, published this information that uh, there were probably a lot of other people with similar experiences who would come forth and tell their own stories. I also thought that uh, some people uh, might uh, read the book who uh, certainly were more intelligent than I was, who might figure out something that would ring a bell somewhere and bring uh, this mystery to a conclusion. Just uh, as to two questions, first of all, what did Bender know that seemed to be the answer to the mystery? And secondly, who were the three men and who were they from? Well, uh, at that time, uh, that had been the only thing that had happened. I believe I have a few minutes to tell you about some of the other things that occurred along about the same time. In Australia, the Australian Flying Saucer Bureau had uh, become a very important thing. It was headed by Mr. E. R. Gerald. Uh, when I was visiting Bender as I was leaving, he held up a letter and said, you may be interested in reading this. I read it. It was from Gerald. It told about a visitor who had come to see him, a visitor who had uh, sworn him to secrecy before he would uh, tell him certain information, which he said he had. Gerald, who was leader of a flying saucer organization and, and wanted to get information out to the public, didn't like the idea, but I suppose he was so intrigued at uh, learning whatever the man had to say that he said, uh, sure, I won't tell anyone if you will tell me what you have in mind. Uh, whereupon the visitor gave him uh, certain information. And, of course, Gerald couldn't tell that. I wrote uh, Gerald a long letter. I naturally couldn't go to see him. He was in Australia and inquired a lot of things from him. I asked him if, uh, if what he heard from the man could uh, make Bender sick or if it had made him ill. He said no, it hadn't made him ill or frightened him too greatly, but someone uh, might be able to take it in a certain way and uh, would be frightened by such information to the point of becoming ill. In, uh, in New Zealand, uh, there was another very uh, reliable investigation, uh, saucer investigative organization, uh, called the uh, Civilian Saucer Investigation of New Zealand, headed by Mr. Fulton. After the matter of Bender had uh, gone along for some time, I found out some very interesting things from New Zealand, which I thought might help solve the mystery in Bridgeport, Connecticut. Gerald and uh, Fulton, according to the latter, were engaged on a, a rather uh, strange project, it sounded like, because it was, it was named Project X. I heard a mention of it some way uh, through the grapevine, and I wrote to Fulton, who had become a good friend of mine, and I said, just what does this Project X involve? Uh, he wrote back, and um, uh, he said that uh, this was a project suggested by Bender shortly before he had been uh, shut up. He said that Bender, uh, having been interested in the number of uh, saucer sightings occurring in the down-under countries such as Australia and New Zealand, had uh, entertained the idea that there might be a base uh, around there or in the Antarctic, and that Bender had suggested that uh, they make a chart taking all of their sightings, which they had in their files, which showed uh, directions of arrival and departure, and putting these on a chart or on a map. If they uh, drew lines uh, the way the saucers were arriving and leaving, and if these lines tended to intersect, it might show a rendezvous point or maybe even a base if there was such a thing for the saucers. At that time, I could see that their uh, suspicions were toward a base in Antarctica. But Bender shut up immediately after that, and the whole thing was dropped. Uh, they didn't get into the project in New Zealand and Australia. And there has always been a question mark in my mind. If that might have been the thing which had rung the bell in Bender's mind, if he had found out some proof that there was a base for flying saucers on the earth, uh, that certainly uh, might cause him some trouble if there was someone who didn't want him to tell about it. Anyway, I began to 
uh, hear other reports in Canada. And incidentally, in, in my book, uh, I don't name this country, uh, a man named Smallwood had a rather uh, shaking experience. Uh, the man in Canada whom I called Smallwood is, is uh, a man called uh, Layman Mitris. Uh, I don't, in the book, I didn't want to mention the fact, but since then it has appeared in a saucer uh, publication, and uh, I suppose is public, uh, written by a fellow who went there and, uh, and pried this information out of uh, small wood independently. Anyway, uh, Mitris was an investigator uh, in Canada who had often sent me information to publish in my little magazine. Uh, one day, he got wind of a fella up north of him uh, who had been fishing on, uh, during vacation and had seen a cigar-shaped object go over and vanish and heard a noise in the bushes. Uh, when he went over to the shore to see what had happened in the bushes, he saw some material, uh, some sort of metallic uh, residue lying on the ground. He picked it up, he said, uh, expecting it to be hot, uh, having fallen out of something, but to his surprise it was strangely cool or cold. He said like feeling the inside of a refrigerator. My friend uh, Mitris uh, wanted to get this story from him to send down to me to publish in my saucerium. Uh, so he got hold of this fellow and begged him for the information, also for a sample of the material. Uh, the fellow was uh, apparently frightened. Uh, he thought that uh, this was a government device which he had seen and that he would be in trouble if he uh, uh, made it known. But uh, my friend Mitris was a persuasive kind of fellow and finally talked uh, the man, whose name I don't know, into giving him a sample of the stuff. Immediately, uh, Mitris sent me a report on the whole affair, and he also sent a uh, sample to a laboratory in a nearby city. Well, uh, as soon as he had received the analysis back, I got a very strange letter from him. Uh, he said that uh, it was something that happened that he didn't care to talk about, that he couldn't talk about the analysis and so forth. Uh, so I called him up on the phone and uh, got in touch with him by mail, and I finally uh, uh, pried some information out of him as to what had happened. And this is what had happened very briefly. Uh, having uh, received the analysis back from the lab on the sample, uh, he received a visitor uh, whom he assumed to be uh, from the government. I don't think he asked him at that time. Perhaps he was uh, a little flustered. And the fellow told him to give him the sample of the material. And uh, uh, Mitris uh, handed it over to him. Uh, he seemed to be uh, rather frightened of this fellow who asked him for this. And then I don't have the whole story, but I understand that the person arrived again at his house and paid him a second visit. At that time, uh, Mitris had collected his wits, and he said to the fellow, show me uh, your credentials. Uh, uh, first, I believe he said, uh, where are you from? And the fellow said, of all things, the uh, mounted police, uh, one of the uh, big agencies in Canada for law enforcement, and uh, Mitris said, let me see your uh, card uh, that shows that you are a member of them. And at that point, uh, the man's uh, almost friendly tone before drastically changed. He became uh, menacing and, and threatening and, uh, and made some threats which for some reason uh, Mitris was afraid to repeat to me. He said he would rather not mention. He intimated that the safety of his family was involved if he talked about this. And he was so frightened that he uh, uh, didn't want anything published about it. Well, when I got ready to write my book, I thought it over and I, I thought this truth should be printed. And uh, if I disguised it by not telling the country uh, where the man was uh, living, nor his name, that it surely wouldn't cause him any trouble. So I printed it without uh, asking him, I'm afraid, uh, for that permission, because if I had, maybe he would have said no, and it wouldn't be in the book. But anyway, it's there. And uh, immediately afterward, uh, the man was uh, quite disturbed and frightened at the mere mention of it. 
Uh, he said, uh, and I get this from another publication, that immediately after the book uh, came out in Canada, uh, about a day afterward, the man who had found the residue uh, mysteriously packed up and left, bag and baggage, as if uh, he were afraid to stay around there any longer. And uh, Mitris was uh, quite disturbed about it. However, I think that he has forgiven me and uh, he has promised to uh, write some additional material as long as it doesn't involve uh, the subject of the material and the, uh, the special report on the analysis. And I've always wondered uh, just who these people were who came to see certain researchers. Uh, maybe some of them had been dreamed up, but surely not all of them. Uh, I wondered uh, what fantastic agency could be sponsoring them. They certainly didn't seem to be government men who came and frightened these people. I wondered if one of them came to see me, if uh, I would be frightened. Well, I thought, surely no, I, I won't be shut up by anyone, but uh, one never knows. Uh, since that time of publishing a book, uh, I uh, had hoped that I would run across several other experiences of quite spectacular nature which I would be able to report to you. But honestly, nothing uh, that important has come to my attention after the book has been written. If other people have been silenced, they're too scared to talk about it. And, or maybe the three men or whoever they are has uh, decided to change their tactics. Here is an interesting letter, however, from France. Uh, I think some of you know of this fellow. He is a leading uh, flying saucer enthusiast in France, a writer who has got out a book. This is confidential, and uh, I'll just let you guess who his name is, but I'm sure you can. Now, this... Uh, Man, although he is a writer, doesn't write very good English, so I will try to stumble through this letter. This is dated April 5, 1956. Dear Gray, uh, your letter of March 17, etc. Believe me or not, Gray, but we have now in France a case of benderism. An engineer and I are preceding our investigations on this strange affair. But it very, is very difficult because the man who received a visit... Uh, four men had vanished. We know he is hidden in southern France. Uh, this guide uh, knew too much about flying saucers. He puts quotes around it because that's the name of my book. We do not think the four men are French agents of government nor agents of another nation. We do not know where they do come from. The man who uh, was involved has received some kind of optic instrument. Now listen to this. Some kind of optic, he means optical, instrument from a pilot, and then he has in parentheses a woman pilot of FS, a flying saucer. Uh, my friend the engineer saw this instrument. He has saw underlined. He has manipulated it and was stupefied to find that the metal of this instrument at its ends was transformed into glass or a lens. In other words, the atomic structure of the metal was changed into the atomic structure of glass. Uh, for the moment, this information is confidential. I ask you not to mention it in your publication. So that leaves me open to tell you about it, I think. It isn't in my publication. If I know more about these affairs, I shall tell you. Since that time, I've been trying to get in touch with this man, but I haven't received any more letters. I suppose if he is actively engaged in, in flying saucer uh, work, that maybe he's just too busy to answer. But he seems to be very much intrigued. Uh, this is the, the author of a uh, very uh, highly respectable French book about flying saucers, uh, which has uh, now uh, been translated and has been published in England. So there you have it, a number of, of strange cases which I am unable to explain. If I were, uh, I certainly uh, don't believe I would have uh, bothered to have written a book. But as yet, I don't have all the answers. I would like to be able to stand up here and, and give you all the answers to the flying saucer riddle because I think you're interested in, in knowing them, but uh, I certainly... Uh, 
uh, would be foolish if I did that because uh, really uh, I uh, know very little more probably than the rest of you. However, I have uh, had an opportunity in this particular thing to know something about Bender and the other people who have been shut up. And that's what I wanted to tell people about in the book and you about here. But let me say in closing here, because my time is up, that I think regardless of, um, of whether uh, flying saucers turn out to be from Mars, uh, from Venus, uh, from Saturn, or maybe, uh, as our friend Mosley says, from the Earth itself, I think that uh, other things have been more important. Even if we find out that there isn't any such things as flying saucers, I think that all our work will have accomplished something because all of us have certainly made a lot of good friends while trying to find out about this. And that certainly, I think, would be worth all our trouble. Thank you very much. because uh, that would be admitting that uh, I knew everything. I favor the idea that flying saucers uh, come from space, from some other planet in our solar system or uh, in some other system. Uh, however, uh, uh, sometimes I also feel that the explanation uh, might be a little more complicated than that that uh, I can even entertain the thought that some of this uh, phenomena uh, might even involve something as complicated as another dimension, but I'm not prepared to go into a thing like that because I know a little about it. It's just a thought. But in repeating, I believe the saucers, uh, uh, the most simplest explanation I know of, are from space, uh, some other planet, and uh, that still it might be uh, along those lines, but a bit more complicated. Uh, in regard to the Brush Creek incident, uh, I did not personally investigate it. However, a uh, fellow who did uh, some research on the West Coast, a Mr. Paul Spade, whom I had a great deal of confidence in, uh, did investigate the matter. He went there and camped with the miners who were involved in this incident, and uh, I'm convinced that uh, what he told us was uh, the truth on that matter. In just a moment, I'll mention something about the Brush Creek monster. Not a monster, but it was a little man. Uh, two miners working titanium digging uh, said they saw a saucer land and a little man uh, get a bucket of water from a creek and uh, climb up into the saucer and fly away. Do I find evidence that uh, saucer sightings are increasing despite uh, strong censorship? Uh, well, uh, first of all, it's a little hard to absolutely prove a formal censorship, but uh, at least now, saucer sightings and incidents are on the increase. Uh, that seems to happen simultaneously with the approach of Mars. As you know, in September, we had uh, the most favorable opposition in Mars in several years, and I believe that it, it, it is established there is a definite connection between uh, the opposition of Mars and the uh, saucer sightings. Uh, we had that in uh, 54 and in 52. Uh, I've often thought that it might be because that people are out observing Mars, looking up at Mars because it's close, and therefore see more things that are going on in the sky. But uh, as Mr. Uh, Michel uh, writes in my latest bulletin, uh, there does seem to be a cycle, and uh, I really expect the heaviest concentration of sightings to occur around October, because it seems as if the heaviest point of sightings uh, doesn't come right at the opposition to Mars, but uh, about a month afterward. And uh, I agree with Mr. Michel in uh, that article he did for my bulletin in that respect. Uh, I have been receiving more reports through the mail and uh, over the phone and so on. That's some indication of um, 
how many have been sane. I called up uh, Lance Stringfield in Cincinnati the other night, and uh, he says that the, the sightings are coming into him at a much greater uh, rate of speed. Uh, they tend to uh, have peaks and low points. It may be that uh, that after this uh, this opposition of Mars, that they may fall off again. Uh, can I uh, reveal any significant changes in Air Force thinking in the past year? Uh, no, I believe uh, such a change uh, would be difficult to see. Uh, the Air Force is still uh, on the same party line that uh, the most of the sightings could be explained logically. Uh, however, they will not go out on a limb and say that the saucers are not from space. They never said that. They lay themselves a, uh, a loophole to get around. Uh, they say that uh, they, they try to uh, hint that they aren't and make us believe they aren't, but they don't definitely say that they aren't. And I think that the stand on saucers with the Air Force has been about the same over the years. Uh, you're asking if the only people who were visited were those who obtained uh, fragments from UFOs. Uh, that is not in, uh, entirely right. Uh, Mr. Uh, Bender had a fragment of a fireball which went through a sign board in Connecticut before uh, the matter occurred to him. However, he told us that had nothing to do with his troubles. There have been some other cases uh, where no fragments seem to have been involved, but it seems in my mind to, uh, to be either one of two things. They have some kind of definite evidence. Uh, they have a fragment of a UFO, or they have uh, some other kind of evidence. Any, any definite evidence uh, would surely crack this thing open, uh, whether that's a fragment or uh, some other kind of proof. Do you think Georgia Gaffney has ever been in the space? You know, uh, that's a really difficult question to answer. First of all, it's, uh, it's not uh, very ethical for one author to uh, comment on the work of another. Uh, frankly, uh, I don't want to believe it, and maybe that's a very narrow-minded opinion I took. But um, over the uh, years since he's read his first book, I've, uh, I've begun to think that uh, there probably is some truth in his books. Uh, I certainly like the first book better than I do the second one, and uh, I have come to this point that I'm still a little confused as to what to believe. But I believe that George Adamski does have some uh, very important knowledge. He has had some experiences. Now, whether uh, in the matter of writing a book that the public could understand, he may have taken some editorial license, I don't know. But... Uh, Adamski is certainly not a man to discount at this time, I don't think. Do I think that Bender will ever reveal his experiences? I don't know. However, uh, he did tell me that um, when uh, and if he could reveal the information, that I would be the first to know. I don't know what his position is on that now. He did not want me to write a book about it. And uh, I called him up before I read it, and he said, don't write it, but I went ahead anyway and did it. So uh, I don't know. He said another thing that's most interesting. He, we asked him if the, when the government would tell the people about saucers. He said, if not within the next uh, five months, I believe, four months, within the next five years. Well, they certainly didn't within the next four months. About five years would take us to 57. Uh, 1957 is the International Geophysical Year, as you know, when uh, we will have uh, sent the satellite up, when uh, people will be greatly cautious of space travel. Perhaps uh, Bender knew about that, being uh, involved in some uh, rocket societies, and that uh, that was the reason he said in about five years. Maybe he felt that uh, 1957 would be a good time for the government to uh, tell the people about it. Anyway, 1957 promises to be a most interesting year for us. How do I think the uh, Marshall monster compares with the Flatwoods monster, and what do I think of it? Uh, I tend to uh, believe that it did happen based upon the people I have talked to who have investigated it. I have not had an opportunity to go there and talk to the people myself. Uh, there were some uh, very similar uh, 
Uh, things about, if you uh, guess my briefcase is down there, but maybe I can remember this, the little one, the little one, I have a newspaper account. Someone read a story there about it, and maybe I can uh, just read you something on that, which, which I thought was interesting because it did sound similar. Looking at that this morning, in fact, I was trying to get a hold of Sid Cater, who wrote this story for the paper, but I found out that he is not with the paper now. This is interesting. Uh, there was an odor about the monster at Marshall. Uh, the boys uh, described it uh, in various ways. In this newspaper story, they said it was like gasoline. And uh, they described it some way else to another person. But the way it, uh, it turns out is that they did smell some odor, which is a little hard to explain. Another thing is the strangeness of its walk. Uh, one of the boys was asked to describe the monster's walk. Quote, it took big, long strides, Herman said. And what did the car, what did the monster do when the car lights hit it? It took the strides faster, he reported. Asked to demonstrate how it walked, he took a step and stopped, turned around and smiled and said he couldn't, he couldn't because, quote, it didn't walk like a man. That is, it didn't bounce as a man has a tendency to do when he is running. It sort of glided. Now listen to that. It sort of glided. And, uh, this newspaper story is comparing this. Uh, I sent up the fellow who wrote the story a copy of the book. Uh, he wrote a previous story to this, and he's taking this book, and uh, he quotes my interview with a, one of the boys who saw the flat woods monster. I asked him to walk around the room. Now, this is a boy I'm questioning about the flat woods monster, uh, where he is being interviewed and to imitate the movement of the thing. That was impossible, he said. I couldn't move as it did. It just moved. It didn't walk. It just moved evenly. It didn't jump. Now, here are two people trying to describe some sort of walk that they've never seen before, and they end up sort of saying that it, it kind of glided or floated. So there is a similarity. Well, I don't have Bender's address with me. It's a, uh, I should like to give it out for this reason, that, uh, that since this thing has happened, some people have got to him, and he says, I uh, have annoyed him considerably because he just doesn't want to talk about it. And I wouldn't want to be the person who, who gave out the address. And uh, if I did and you went to see him, he wouldn't, uh, he wouldn't talk to you about it because that's been, uh, been tried. But uh, he does live in Bridgeport, Connecticut, and uh, is going about a very normal existence. About two years after all of these incidents uh, occurred, he was married. Occasionally I have heard from him, however, he doesn't discuss saucers. Uh, he is an executive of some sort, not a, a really big executive, but uh, holds some executive position in the Acme Shear Plant in uh, Bridgeport. Uh, they make uh, scissors, ordinary scissors. As I said, he's going about his life just as you and I did before we took up saucers. Only, only he just doesn't want to have anything more to do with them. So you want a, the Maury Island incident? Uh, yes, uh, uh, that really comes from one of the first books, and a very interesting one, called The Coming of the Saucers, written by Kenneth Arnold and published by Ray Palmer. Uh, in Maury uh, Island in uh, Tacoma, Washington, uh, some donut-shaped objects were sighted uh, by uh, two harbor patrolmen. Uh, these uh, disks or, or donut-shaped objects seem to be in trouble. They expelled some sort of residue from them, uh, which uh, was a kind of slag which fell all around them, and I understand killed a dog and injured uh, one of the uh, kids that was with them. Uh, after that, uh, Air Force investigators came in and took some of this material and uh, in their plane, uh, and the plane did crash under rather mysterious circumstances that they were taking off. However, I understand that there was other residue uh, which uh, was preserved and which some people still have. The uh, Project Saucer, the old uh, Air Force Agency for Investigating Saucers, uh, poo-pooed the idea considerably. Uh, they said they had exposed the, the Maury Island thing as a hoax and that uh, these were only slag, uh, these fragments. Uh, in Rupelt's book, he says that it was a hoax. Uh, I report something about that in my book, incidentally. I think it was very interesting, and I certainly am not saying that it was a hoax until I have some definite uh, proof that it was. What can be said or known about the fireballs? Uh, you're probably 
Uh, most of you thinking about the green fireballs of the southwest, which uh, Dr. Lopez, I believe, has investigated. Uh, that is one of the most puzzling cases of UFOs on record. Uh, the things uh, are seen uh, traveling at great rates of speed and then exploding with a tremendous splash. However, no noise is heard. If those were real meteors, so says Dr. Lopez, uh, you certainly would hear them because they would sound as loud as a freight train. Uh, neither, as I understand, uh, have any fragments of them been found. But I would assume uh, that uh, those projects are highly classified and that uh, if something were found, uh, it would be secret. Do I feel flying saucers are lurking in our outer space? Uh, by that, do you mean possibly in our, uh, just above our atmosphere around our Earth? Yes, if I certainly think they must be around somewhere pretty close and, and keep around close. Uh, we see so many of them. Uh, some of the astronomers were looking uh, recently for satellites, which uh, some people hinted were artificial, which was circling the Earth. Uh, they tried to pass these off as uh, little moons, which they may or may not have been. Uh, if uh, flying saucers are coming here from another planet, and if they are somewhat limited in uh, speed, range, and so forth, it would, might be logical that they would have installed around the Earth uh, uh, rather large uh, space stations, or perhaps the mother ships that we hear about, to service uh, these machines. Uh, that is uh, very interesting to uh, think about, and we do have some uh, proof that there is something out there orbiting the Earth because the astronomers have been looking for them. Getting to the Shaver mystery, which uh, it causes so much controversy that uh, uh, perhaps one shouldn't talk about it. In my book, I'm certainly not uh, saying that I accept it 100%. Uh, I'm just uh, reporting it because it is interesting and it seemed to fit in with some of the things we were doing at the time of the Bender mystery. Now, as far as uh, what the D-Rose looked like, Shaver explained that they look something like people, but, um, but very uh, degenerate looking people, uh, something uh, maybe like the witches uh, are pictured as looking, maybe a bit uh, haggard and uh, dried up looking, very evil looking, and that sort of thing. Uh, you're asking, uh, these monsters which we have talked about, could they be robots set down here by the saucer people uh, to investigate uh, things such as fault lines or, tr or trying to help us in some way? In other words, uh, coming into perilous territory where the actual people in disks would not like to come, but instead they might send some robot or man-like uh, robots down here to, uh, to find out. Now, I think that's logical. Uh, the uh, Flatwoods monster, as I bring out in the book, does sound something like a robot. It, it looks like our conception of one, at least, to some degree. And, uh, or it, there's some of those monsters which are so terrifying to us simply could be maybe some ordinary-looking uh, creature in a space suit which uh, might look pretty spooky to us. It's pretty logical that they might send down a mechanical uh, contrivance of some kind that could get around uh, like a man and collect some of this information, which they surely would be able to do and send back by radio to a ship. I believe that's all the time we have. Thank you very much. I wish I could answer more. Thank you all folks for coming here tonight and uh, participating in this uh, wonderful event. Thank you again. We hope to see you again sometime.